This manual is published for the information and guidance of all our friends and should be used as the basic doctrine for sedition and subversion training in preparation for active simple sabotage. As a precursor to the ethics-based selective irregular warfare that will act as the final blow to the state. Sedition is defined as conduct or speech inciting the rejection of established authority. Subversion implies the use of economic, underhanded, covert, or violent methods to change or abolish governments. We acknowledge that the primary mission of anarchists should be to use peaceful methods of persuasion and propaganda to educate as many people as possible as to the evils of the state and to use the positive aspects of sound economics and peaceful voluntary exchange to offer an alternative to aggression and war. We acknowledge that the vast majority of anarchists should not be involved in any violent or destructive behavior and should quickly disavow any connection to violence and destruction. But we acknowledge that self-defense sometimes requires proactive measures. We also understand that foolish actions, however morally justified, will in all likelihood not result in a positive outcome. Therefore, we submit this manual in an attempt to provide direction for those who are suited for taking the hard actions that others should wisely forego. Precautions Generally speaking, sabotage instructions and subversive plans of all kinds should be dispersed in separate pamphlets or leaflets according to categories of operations and should be distributed with care and not broadly. They should be used as a basis for podcasts, internet articles, and low-power radio broadcasts. As a collection, such instructions should be kept on secure drives with safe encryption. Perspective Going back into antiquity, various generations have repeated a version of the same myth, that being the idea that you are the chosen generation, and you are the children of destiny. This is the dawning of a new age, or the end of ages. The age of Aquarius has arrived. These are the end times, or Jesus is about to return and we will be the generation who will see him returning in the clouds. This myth is not new, and it is not unique to this or any generation. One current manifestation of this myth has gained some popularity of late, that being the idea that we can have, quote, liberty in our lifetime, end quote, or escape to a, quote, galt's gulch, end quote, where we all live in peace. Most of the salesmen for these gimmicks are simply honest believers filled with hope serving the existing myth. But some are true con men who use these myths to milk the gullible of money or convince their followers to join some cult or movement. Usually a dynamic leader with an outlandish personality will convince the followers to send him their cash or to migrate to some remote location. Often once the big event fails to happen, the movement either dies or mutates into a mainstream shadow of its former self. There are a variety of causes behind this repeating myth, and the outcome can be tragic or benign or anywhere in between. But the point is to recognize such myths for what they are and guard yourself from being caught up in this false hope. Our enemy, the state, is in this for the long haul. He is not attached to one government, one central banking institution, one corporation, one royal family, or one generation. The state is a deity that is older than any other organized religion. Before Vasudeva beheld Krishna, the state was old. Before Buddha contemplated the meaning of peace, the state had perfected war. Before Father Abraham was born, the state had risen, fallen, and had risen again. The state was already ancient when an Egyptian pharaoh, for the very first time, bowed his knee and lifted a sacrifice to the great Ra rising in the east. To understand the nature of the state, and then to believe that you are the one magic generation that will defeat this beast is the height of arrogance. The state feels no fear for us, 
and its current politicians, bureaucrats, central bankers, CEOs, police, and military-industrial complex have no fear of us. Few of them even know we exist. And thus we have the advantage. Without our enemy's knowledge, we can fully infiltrate its structure. We can know what our captors are saying behind closed doors. We can plot the downfall of this deity from within the walls of its temples. But we cannot act with urgency. We must embrace wisdom and forego dynamic personalities and the giant egos that drive wannabe leaders. We must prepare for a generational battle. We must understand the weaknesses of collectivism and central planning and develop the power of the individual independent scholar warrior. We must incorporate decentralization and distributed networks in our methods and teach the next generation how to take up this fight and continue it without depending on outlandish personalities and short-sighted gimmicks. We must take on the challenge that our forefathers sidestepped. Yes, the state can be defeated in one generation, but it will most likely take as many generations of hard work to prepare that generation for its task. Thus far, most of the work done by anarchists has been confined to talking to and arguing while repeating the same mistakes earlier anarchists have repeated since the time of their fathers. Now we must mature in wisdom and start developing the long battle. It's time for us to set aside the expectation of a great man to deliver us. It's time to ignore the cute cheerleaders of all genders on the sidelines and realize there is a hard and bloody task ahead and not everyone is fit for it. Not every step is a step in the right direction, and if we are going to reach the destination we seek, we must plot out that path and stop running after every melodic voice that we hear in the wind. Finally, this field manual is not a step-by-step -step literal guide. It is an outline of concepts. It is intended to stimulate thought. Some suggestions contained herein will be more valuable than others. Some suggestions will quickly become outdated. That is the reason this manual is listed as provisional, because it is not set in stone. The greatest weapon a human being owns is his mind and that is a weapon the state lacks. We expect you will use yours. 1. Introduction to the Basic Concepts of Simple Sabotage Question. Why? The purpose of this manual is to justify and characterize simple sabotage, to outline its possible effects, and to present suggestions for inciting and executing it to its fullest. We understand that the concept of the state is a mental construct based on the existence of a coercive, monopolistic governments in conjunction with key codependent corporations and others used to control, manipulate, and enslave humanity. We understand that this system of coercive monopoly is nothing more than the current manifestation of the most successful crime gangs working in conjunction to extort the maximum amount of wealth from the residents of their respective agreed-upon geographic territories. Further, we understand that coercive, centrally planned governments are inheritably flawed, both morally and economically, and thusly unstable. Left to themselves, violent governments tend to collapse, but in their fall they are typically replaced by an equally unstable and corrupt crime gang that becomes the new government, often made up of the most violent elements of the previous government. Therefore, it is not the purpose of this manual to hasten the fall of one government so that it can be replaced by another. Rather, it is our goal to destabilize the concept of the state in the minds of its believers around the world so that we may all escape the cycle of coercion and slavery. To accomplish this goal, we are encouraging acts of sabotage as a method of exposing the instability and the failures of all governments to provide the services that they claim the monopolistic right to control. A common fallacy that has worked to pacify one generation after the next is the idea that, quote, capitalism, unquote, is the true evil and equality is the enemy of humanity. 
That's right. Ambiguous words are our enemy. In this scenario, the faithful believer mostly ignores the concept of the coercive state and is convinced that with enough central planning by just the right people or some great man, benevolent government can redistribute wealth and everyone will get a piece of the pie. In fact, the silly notion ignores the hard facts of economics and is founded on an amazing ignorance of history coupled with a childish lack of morals. The fantasy that perfect central planning will produce equality, and that will in turn produce the perfect man who will be thrilled to live his life sweating in a communal factory or standing in line for bread, has instead produced crushing poverty and starvation, followed by mass death and eventual government upheaval or revolution. Then finally, the adoption of the very type of capitalism that was hated to begin with. This capitalism actually being fascism in economic terms. Another common fallacy that has hindered many organized movements towards freedom is the myth that to shrink government or government's influence to a manageable size would somehow weaken government and make the slavery of the coercive state acceptable. A segment of each generation believes that if they can wrestle control of government, perhaps through secession or through infiltration of governments by patriots or some great man, usually a politician, celebrity, or military hero, then the nature of human beings will magically shift and coercion on a smaller local level will produce lasting peace and freedom. In other words, the beatings will continue until morale improves. Of course, this never happens. Coercion only produces more coercion. Theft doesn't stimulate productivity. It stimulates poverty and more theft. Prisons don't produce obedient, docile citizens. They produce harder criminals. Rape doesn't stimulate love and affection. It creates hate and retribution. Small, weak tyrants provide the opportunity for larger, stronger tyrants. Much like revolution, secession and conservative policies simply lead to a change of guards on the prison walls with more violent, deadly tyrants heading up local serfdoms that eventually become absorbed or annexed back into a developing empire, and the cycle repeats. The, quote, conservative dreams of a mythical past when government was, quote, good, but in fact that history is a lie that never happened. Government was never good, and the, quote, founding fathers of today's conservatives were the progressive tyrants of yesterday's conservatives. In the end, both of these paths are simply the socialist veil of lies and tricks behind which the state is hidden throughout its bloody reign of terror. Misdirected belief in these myths has shown consistently to be the very foundations on which the perpetuation of the state rests. From Ecclesiastes 7.10 Say not, where were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask. In addition to everything stated above, History displays for us a predictable cycle that must be broken if humanity is ever to achieve freedom, or in fact even survive as a species. It is the nature of humans to suffer inconvenience and oppression rather than risk drastic and dangerous change right up to the point that they can no longer tolerate the oppression. When they are frustrated to the point of uprising, typically some government actor, commonly an orator or military leader, will rise up to speak for the downtrodden. Violent action is taken, and government either falls into bloody revolution, mass murder and war, and then into the hands of a worse tyrant than before, or it appears to take on a dramatic metamorphic transformation into a manageable, more tolerable friendly government based on promises or guarantees of rights. It seems to the short-term observer that this later development is good. In fact, it is far worse than the open tyrant. 
Because of the economic advantages of the friendly government, businesses flourish and the friendly government develops vast wealth and power that the openly tyrannical government could never have achieved. With this wealth, the friendly government either develops an aggressive military culture or it becomes subservient to a government with an aggressive military culture which then turns its oppression outside its borders and becomes a far more deadly force than the openly tyrannical government could ever have achieved. With fanatical followers within its own borders, a radical military culture, and a more business-friendly environment, corporate, government, marriage, etc., the friendly government becomes a far worse tyranny than it ever could have before it merged with business. Governments like this have become a force for evil that not only threatens humanity, but has now in our lifetimes become a threat to all life on the entire planet. At this point in time, it's unclear how many more cycles of good government our species can tolerate. As odd as it may seem, wishing and working for a smaller, more manageable government not only pushes the responsibility and burden to the next generation, it makes it more likely that the new version of the friendly government will become something the last generation could not have imagined. This is how the cycle of good government works. If we can come to the conclusion that we must stop doing the same thing over and over, attempting to come up with a different result, then logic drives us to the old question, what shall this man do? The answer to that question is that we must learn the true art of war and incorporate wisdom into our efforts. Recognizing the above described cycle is one aspect of the principle of knowing oneself and knowing one's enemy. We must fight in a way that disarms our enemy while strengthening ourselves. We must stop believing that using the tools governments supply to us will work to defeat the state. We must reject all political solutions. We must reject civil disobedience and every other method of begging the master for mercy. We must learn the weaknesses of central planning and collectivism and develop the strengths of independence and individuality. We must reject the idea of tearing down the military-industrial banking complex and we must concentrate on learning how to cause the beast to lose its footing and allow its own bloated torso to crush the thin legs that hold it up. For one practical example, we must stop silly pursuits like demanding government, quote, in the Fed, and realize that we have the power to ignore the Fed through cryptocurrencies. Let governments run their debts to the sky and devalue their money. It only helps us in the long term as it proves our point that governments are nothing more than criminal gangs and the state is a destructive religion that needs to pass into the dust heap of history with other nonsensical violent religions. In knowing ourselves and knowing our enemy, we must recognize the vast resource advantages that the state possesses and we must resist every traditional military action. Knowing that the state possesses an endless supply of young foolish men who will fight and die on command, while our numbers will always be limited to a small, dedicated force, we can never fight the state using numbers, attrition, or open conflict. Considering that our enemy possesses most of the world's wealth along with the ability to create more money on demand, it would be foolish to believe that we can spend our way to victory. When fighting a vastly more powerful opponent, The wise warrior simply doesn't allow his enemy to know where or who he is. We must never openly confront the state and reveal our positions, our strength, nor our intentions. Martyrs, messiahs, heroes, and great men will not deliver us from this evil. Brave last stands, angry marches, civil disobedience, and loud proclamations will never serve our ends. Risking our numbers to occupy a physical location or region will only serve to make it easier for our enemy to find and subdue us. Openly petitioning and begging government has never been and never will be the path to our freedom. 
openly threatening a vastly superior enemy is never wise. Our deliverance will come from an extended series of principled actions done clandestinely by individuals, based on wisdom and not emotion nor hero glorification. We must choose every battlefield and we must choose the timing and circumstances of every interaction. We must seek out our enemy's weak points and capitalize on them. We must systematically bring this beast to its knees by its own weight. This is the role of simple sabotage until such a time comes that our enemy is weakened to the point that individual riflemen can finish the job by decapitation of the beast through ethics-based selective irregular warfare. In this way, simple sabotage is the precursor that will allow selective irregular warfare to be the final death blow to the state. Stage 2. What? Sabotage varies from a highly technical coup de main acts that require detailed planning and the use of specially trained operatives to innumerable simple acts which the ordinary individual friend saboteur can perform. This manual is primarily concerned with the latter type. Simple sabotage should not require specially prepared tools or equipment. It is executed by an ordinary friend of freedom who may or may not act individually and without the necessity for an active connection with an organized group. And it is carried out in such a way as to involve a minimum danger of injury, detection, or reprisal. Where destruction is involved... The weapons of the friend saboteur are such things as salt, nails, candles, pebbles, thread, lip balm, or any other materials he might normally be expected to possess at home or as a worker in his particular occupation. His arsenal is the kitchen shelf, the trash pile, and his own usual kit of tools and supplies. The targets of his sabotage are usually objects to which he has normal and inconspicuous access in everyday life, and ideally that others have access to as well. A second type of simple sabotage requires no destructive tools whatsoever and only produces physical damage, if any, by highly indirect means. It is based on universal opportunities to make faulty decisions to adopt a non-cooperative attitude, and to induce others to follow suit. Making a faulty decision may be simply a matter of placing tools in one spot instead of another. A non-cooperative attitude may involve nothing more than creating an unpleasant situation among one's fellow workers, engaging in bickering, or displaying surliness or stupidity. Introducing strife and division among fellow government employees or playing up the weaknesses of management or recognized leaders. Even the spreading of rumors can be an effective form of sedition. In short, slacktivism, defined thusly, can be as effective, if not more effective, as traditional activism. Slacktivism, sometimes referred to as, quote, the human element, is frequently responsible for accidents, delays, and general obstruction even under normal conditions. The potential saboteur should discover what types of faulty decisions in the operations are normally found in his kind of work and should then devise his sabotage so as to enlarge that margin for error as far as reasonably possible without risking discovery. It's difficult to oversell this point. One of, if not the major weakness of every government and every large corporation is the human element. The vast majority of government and corporate employees simply don't care if their employer runs efficiently and competitively or not. There is little to no motivation for the average employee to produce anything over the bare minimum, much less to excel above or beyond the mediocre level of his fellow employees routinely produce. Thus, we have the perfect environment to take the built-in errors of the human element and magnify them to the point of crippling the workings of government and the key corporations that keep governments functioning. Another example of simple sabotage using the human element can involve blackmail, extortion, and scandal. 
These types of operations can be quite dangerous and should be left to those experienced in such matters. However, this type of simple sabotage can also be invaluable in both financing further operations and in unveiling the despicable nature of the authoritarians. For this reason, training for such activities should be encouraged. Acting classes, practical demonstrations, step-by-step instructions, and the study of historical examples should be encouraged until teams are developed who can perfect this racket. Computer hackers are exceptionally effective in revealing personal information about politicians and other state actors. Famous mainstream media personalities are often portrayed as honest and dependable, but behind the scenes they are violent, despicable thugs. Exposing them as such can be dangerous, but extremely effective and rewarding. Also, various forms of doxing can be extremely effective in harassing and demoralizing the leadership of the military-industrial complex and the central banking complex. The wildly inappropriate reaction of government to the hacking in the Stratfor scandal showed how much the powers that be fear the hacking community, and for good reason. Stage 3. Where? Acts of simple sabotage should be occurring everywhere that our friends are located. Efforts should be made to add to their efficiency, lessen their detectability, and increase their number. Acts of simple sabotage, multiplied by tens of thousands of friend saboteurs, can be an effective weapon against governments and corporations, and therefore against the international state itself. Slashing tires, draining fuel tanks, spreading rumors, starting arguments, encouraging bad decisions in the workplace, short-circuiting electric systems, and abrading machine parts will waste materials, manpower, and resources. Occurring on a wide scale, simple sabotage will be a constant and tangible drag on the efforts of the state to appear omnipotent and omnipresent. It is arguable that the prime mission of the friend saboteur is to facilitate the failure of the state's governmental systems by using the systems themselves, and then, when the time is right, to set the stage for selective, irregular warfare to strike individual elements of the state. Simple sabotage may also have a quick return of investment on secondary results of more or less value. The widespread practice of simple sabotage will harass and demoralize administrators, bureaucrats, and their police enforcers, and may disrupt their lives to the point that they make even more foolish choices than they would have otherwise. Further, success may embolden the friend saboteur eventually to find colleagues who can assist him in sabotage of greater dimensions from inside the departments he is targeting. Finally, the very practice of simple sabotage by friends embedded in government and key corporations may encourage these individuals to identify themselves actively with an alliance of friends, the Lego Distribution Network, or other groups, and establish a local committee of friends to further our efforts in the deconstruction of the state and its puppet governments and crony corporations. Stage 4. When? If our grandfathers were half the men we imagine them to have been, they would have already completed this task. And if their grandfathers before them had been half the men they imagined them to be, our grandfathers would not have had the opportunity to pass this burden to us. Now we stand, thousands of years bound in slavery to the state, with the choice of passing this hideous beast on for our grandchildren to serve, or being the men we ought to be, once and for all times, freeing humanity. Once you have become aware of the beast, this is the choice, to voluntarily join in resisting or to voluntarily remain bound. Therefore, only the individual can decide when he has had enough of being a slave and when he is morally obligated to set himself free. Stage 5. How? History has shown that working within the confines of the laws that governments have manufactured has never and can never do anything but perpetuate the immoral system that protects and nurtures the state. 
History has further shown that to confront governments using traditional revolutionary tactics only serves to replace one tyrannical government with another, and again, this strengthens the international state. Historically, the third option people have attempted repeatedly over millennia is to attempt to escape the state by moving to a location where the tentacles of governments have yet to reach. The state has defeated this tactic by continually growing and systematically engulfing and devouring those free people, often through open slaughter of whole populations. Finally, the desperate have, on many occasions, attempted to fortify some kind of stronghold and wait for a messianic or apocalyptic deliverance from the heavens. Of course, this has never worked and usually ends in a regrettable bloodbath, leaving only a handful of survivors at best. It is with hard examples from history that this three-pronged method, above-ground activists, underground simple sabotage, and ethics-based selective irregular warfare has developed. Using lessons learned and finding the best practices from all available sources, this manual seeks to encourage both actions and observations that will stimulate the improvement of our efforts. We know that the education of the masses and understanding freedom is paramount and the freedom we offer must be sold to humanity in the marketplace of ideas. But we also understand that so long as the coercive state appears to fulfill its promises of economic growth, security, prosperity, infrastructure, and justice, while appearing omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, we have a distinct sales advantage. It's only through the failure of the state that the market will seek an alternative. Therefore, we seek to be that mechanism that drives the failure of the state. We do this understanding that our enemy will not hesitate to murder on a grand and hideous scale to maintain its position. Therefore, limited by our commitment of not initiating aggression upon peaceful people, nor upon the property of said people. We must endeavor to find ways to become the catalyst that begins the lethal reaction that will dissolve the foundations of the state. We must be the ones who take the shoes from our feet and cram them into the gears of oppression, bringing this machine to a halt. Stage 6. Who? Quote, A small varmint that can spoil one vine undetected could ruin the vineyard. Who has the government enslaved? Who is the child, the brother, the mother, the friend of someone government has murdered or unjustly imprisoned? Who has tried to start a business but was overwhelmed by regulations or taxes? Who has tried to catch a fish to feed his children but didn't have the proper government permission slip? Who has struggled through the death of a parent only to find government has ravished the estate and left the family in debt? Who has ever looked in the rearview mirror of their automobile and has been gripped by fear knowing the cop behind them can rape them and beat them to death and never be punished for his crime? Who has had their life turned upside down by an uncaring, half-wit, dead-eyed government bureaucrat just doing his job? Who has never been directly confronted by authorities, yet has compassion for the downtrodden and empathy for the victims of oppression? These are potentially our friends, supporters, and possibly even fellow saboteurs. And with every filmed police brutality, with every repressive act of government, with every asset seizure, with every drone that kills a child, the state creates more of them every single day. Who takes orders at the restaurant? Who fills prescriptions at the pharmacy? Who empties the trash at the office? Who stands guard at the factory late into the night? Who installs the wires in the new government courthouse? Who repairs the heating and cooling system at the police station? Who routes the airplanes over the vast expanses of the prairies? 
Who programs the traffic lights that keep the surges of life flowing through the city during rush hours? Who drives the ambulance that brings the suffering to the hospital? Who bravely walks into the burning building to save a life? Who is the trusted IT specialist that has access to the network that holds the video that the world needs to see? The answer is the same as above. The answer is, it is us, the abused, the victims of government and those sympathetic and the empathetic to our plight. And the state creates more of us every single day. We are everywhere. We have no great leader, and we must never have a great leader. We are regular people living regular lives. We write programs that allow desktop computer-controlled milling machines to cut untraceable parts for military-grade weapons in the tool shed of the farmer in Kansas. We write the virus that invades the government computer network to create backdoors. We mow the lawn at the senator's home while his children nap in their nursery. We hold the oxygen mask snugly against the face of the city mayor as he drifts into a state that allows him to comfortably have that important surgery. We push the cart and deliver the inter-office mail to the desks of the intelligence analysts who study the results of drone strikes. We inspect the brakes of the fleet vehicles and the motor pool that serves the lobbyists that will meet with the Ways and Means Committee this afternoon. We do these things. We allow the whole system around us to continue, and we can stop that entire system or critical aspects of it any time we decide it needs to stop. This is who we are, and this is what we can do. And the state creates more of us every single day.